Well, it, I logged in and I could uh, I could hear you fine, but I sure. don't think I have an, an, a mic to use to plug into my computer. So I thought I'd get wise and use my uh, my uh, video game headphones or whatever, and I grabbed those. Is that what you're on right now? Uh, no, actually, I'm, oh. on my phone. I'm on my phone now. Are you a are you a pretty big gamer? Uh, well, I used to be <laughs> until I got busy and past couple months i've had a lot of free time or more free time so i usually uh kill some time by playing some video games what's your uh, what's your flavor first person shooter stuff online or minecraft yeah, i you know i i kind of i'm kind of the same way with uh certain bands i find something i dig and then i get overly into it so i started out i still play like uh the original Black Ops Nazi Zombies, pretty re- religiously. It's classic. Yep. Um, and then, I, I mean, back in the day, I used to play a lot of Madden, but I don't have three hours to waste on one game anymore, so I don't do that as much. But mostly, uh, yeah, I, I, I have a PS4. My son plays a lot of Fortnite and Minecraft and stuff, and I, I bought all these games, and I just never had time to play them. And now I, I did a search for like top 10 ps4 games or whatnot and i realize i have like half of them i just never played them (laughs) i know it's been uh it's been video game season for uh, myself and i think the other guys in weather check too ross and i've been playing a bunch of uh fallout 76 basically the the fortnite part of the game just the online uh whatever you call it battle royale style yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, i uh i just i heard from a a buddy of mine probably like a week or so ago and He's like, dude, you got to get uh, the the battle royale version of the new Call of Duty or whatever. And so I went and I tried to buy it, and I looked like an idiot because apparently it's free, and you just download it off the PS4 store. So oh shoot, um, I ran home and downloaded it and got my ass kicked pretty badly. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling, dude. Freebie, like, that's a pro tip. Yeah, I mean, just like uh, most things. Uh, right about now it's just kind of weird it feels like everything's in a pause mode and i gotta kill some i gotta kill some time and it seems like a good way to do it yeah so i gotta ask your last name is it esno is that how you say it yes yeah, very good hell yeah your email nice. gave it away though because it's just yeah. easy you know <laughs> you could have said ease no but yeah ease no Ugh, no I've all right ease geez no on yeah. ease no <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's pronounced like fresno right esno I think you left it. Well, you, you're the you're the law here. You could have said anything, and I would have stuck with it. I know. I could have changed it to like Thomas or something. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a lot about King Brown, but let's start with um, music that you like to listen to. Uh, local artists. You sent me uh, the Dames Piss Pot, and that's like that's heavy metal, man. That's right up my alley. What is it, it about? Your face off, huh? Oh hell yeah, dude! It was sick. What is it yeah. about that song and that band? Well. Without going too far back, um, like the early 2000s, uh, I was married at the time and kind of stuck in the suburban life of, you know, khakis and lawnmowers. And (laughs) I hadn't played my drums in a couple years because we had just had our first child. And um, not that I, you know, gave up on it. I just, I was busy, you know, and um, I started getting more interested in the local scene. I joined a you know a couple goofy message forums, and just you know started paying attention to the bands that were out there at the time. I think it was like two thousand three, two thousand four, around that time. And you know I I just was really impressed. I, I they were really popular back then. Um, the, both the Dames and Houston and some other bands like uh, Casanatra and and Self Evident and a couple others. Um, and I mean, it just blew me away. I was impressed with, you know, the toughness of it. It was very snarky, in your face, kind of, you know, tapping you in the middle of your chest with the with the index finger, kind of just gnarly, rip your face off kind of riffing. And, um, you know, that whole that whole time frame, I guess I, I I learned that you know you don't have to listen to national acts to find good music it was basically you know right here in town and i just kind of absorbed as much of it as i could and kind of you know 
kind of became a fanboy in the background and um they're a uh, three piece from Duluth um which was kind of odd normally you'd you'd think of you know a Duluth band to come out sounding more like Bob Dylan or country or something like that and these guys were just all attitude and yeah I mean they've made a couple appearances since then and um to this day um Divorce is probably one of my favorite CDs ever ever made by a local band here I think it kind of stands the test of time. Yeah, I like your point about the Duluth Axe. When I think of Axe coming out of Duluth, I think of your sort of big mustache and beard, Pertnier Sandstone, Trampled by Turtles-y right. folk. And yeah. this, this is very much like blue jean, blue collar, uh, like working man's metal. It's not yes. overly complex. And I mean that in a good way. It's just it's right. just straight to the point. Um, so I'm going to have to look into them more, honestly. I really like the sound of that. Yeah, uh, for sure. Well, if you, uh, you're sticking with us, this is the down low on the Twin Cities. I'm talking with Aaron Esno of King Brown. He plays with them that dare as well. And this is just a little chat, doing it once a week, talking about what's going on in Minnesota while everyone's stuck inside, everyone's all these performers itching to get on stage and entertain. So Aaron is the drummer for a blues-based two-piece hard rocking thing. It's called King Brown. It's really cool. Uh, Three-piece is them that dare. He's got tracks that are playing on KFAI, Rockin' 101 in St. Cloud, 93X Loud and Local, and they put out a self titled EP King Brown did in November and uh, I, we played that show the band Diamond Weather Check and it's it's always been a pleasure playing with you guys we've played a, a few shows here or there so let me uh, go from playing music to buying music what's your favorite go-to record store in or around the Twin Cities um, either uh, down in the valley or the electric fetus um, you know to be honest I, I don't do a lot of uh, new music purchasing I usually hear about it through word of mouth through you know one of my musician friends or um you know i'll hear something on the radio and i'll catch my ear um but but yeah i I, i'm kind of out of the loop when it comes to a lot of the the current stuff i mean i've i've heard uh great things from i don't know if you've heard of them a band called king buffalo um i know the name but that's it yeah those guys absolutely shred but you know uh, to be honest most of my most of my uh time spent is you know with alex and and the other guys trying to you know create our own music mm -hmm. are you you feel like your library sort of built up then and you lean on lean on what you know or do you mostly listen to podcasts then or uh just... pretty, pretty much yeah i mean like i um i'm always listening to sabbath or zeppelin or the beatles it seems or you Hell know yeah. things of that nature um obviously Bands like Caius and Queens of the Stone Age are, are popular in this household, uh, even with my kids. So, um, not that not that it's on current rotation, but um, you know, that's I guess that's the general genre that I, I tend to lean back on, fall back on. Well, that's rad, man. If your kids are listening to Caius and Queens of the Stone Age, <laughs> you're, yeah. that's parenting done right. You get my stamp of approval, anyway, well, <laughs> for for what it's worth. Yeah. Let's go with your favorite place to see a show, favorite venue. Um, well, I, I'd probably have to say the entry, you know, uh, it's always been one of my favorite rooms in the cities to not only play in, but, um, you know, go see a show. It, it's, it has the, the right amount of, uh, speakers for the, the right size of room. And I don't know, there's just something about that place. You know, you get the right <laughs> band and a, a decent crowd in there and it's just kind of electric. Um, I, Went to, I, I saw a couple bands uh, at the Armory. I was I was uh, surprisingly impressed with uh, with how well it sounded in there. You know, from the outside, it looks like a, a huge oversized bar, uh, barn, but you get in there and uh, it, it sounded really nice. What was the last show you saw at the Armory? Uh, I think it was Alice in Chains. Oh God, that sounds awesome. Yeah, it was it was a pretty epic night. <laughs> I've seen I've seen a handful of shows there. I saw Priest there and Rackin Tours and and somebody else and it I was impressed too. You know, it's nice that it's just open floor, general admission, even right. sight lines no matter where you are. I thought the sound was good. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I I guess for you know, last 5 years I've I've also seen a couple bands like out at the Myth and it kind of reminded me of like a better bigger version of the Myth, you know. You, <laughs> Amen. It wasn't a bad seat in the house and there was enough room where you weren't, you know, 
rubbing elbows with with every stranger and it it sounded really decent yeah you you down to play a game i got a i've got a new feature i want to do it's called real minnesota craft beer or not oh god i'm dead okay <laughs> real minnesota craft beer or not oh yeah Okay, so here's how it goes. I'm going to give you the name of a craft beer, and you have to tell me whether it's a real Minnesota craft beer or not. So you got a 50-50 shot. It's not too hard. All right. So the first one on the list is from Steel Toe Brewing. It's the Occupational Hazard Sour, and it's described as kettled sour with a rooty bite, fruit punch meets angry grapes. Oh, that has to be real. That's fake? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would yeah, it's a good name though. They should if they don't yet get occupational hazard on their menu somewhere. Yeah, it sounds Minnesotan. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh Fair State Brewing. Fair State Brewing's Brown Ales Don't Sell Brown Ale. It's described as toasty, mild roast, mild sweetness, substantially bitter with a little piney aroma. Uh, that has to be real. That one is real. Yes. <laughs> there you go. I like that name too. I love how open they are with that. They're going, yeah, it doesn't sell. Let's just, let's just name it that. Yeah. From Fulton, the Natalie Porterman Nitro Porter. Let me uh, see. I'm going to have to say no. Yeah, yeah, you're right on that one. That was a stretch. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, two more. Bald Man Brewings, Heart of Glass Blondie Ale. It says light and fresh flavor with a gentle multi finish, 4.2%. Uh, yeah, that's real. That is real. That is real. I've had it. It's pretty good too. Have you been to Bald Man? Uh, I have not. They're. Uh, I was impressed. They're very music focused. It's like oh. a a rock brewery. You walk in there and there are brew tanks. One of them says Clapton. One says Page. Um, and I think the other one has the Prince symbol on it. And it, I, the soundtrack was killer. The one day I was in there. Nice. Where are they located? Uh, Egan. Egan. Okay. Yep. Nice. Yep. Uh, number five, last one from Summit Brewing, the Stoned Sherpa Hazy IPA. It says juicy tropical fruits collide with freshly harvested dank hops, sending your taste buds higher than the most expert of Sherpas. Uh, I'd say no. That's right. You're right. It sounds something like a, a beer you'd find in Denver. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> well, nicely done, man. That's the first time we've done a, uh, a real craft brew or not. I think we'll come back to that one in some future shows. Are, are you, you're a beer drinker, right? What's your go-to? Um, not re- I'm not a huge drinker, to be honest. Um, hmm. I, I do like having a beer or two during the summer months, but um, for the most part, it's if I do drink, it's Jäger, Jägermeister until I, I start feeling good, and then I cut it off and... Yeah. Very good. So let's talk about getting on stage. What do you most like about performing? What is it that, that keeps you hauling a giant ass drum kit to show after show after show? <laughs> uh, you know, it's just something that I've always been comfortable with. Um, I guess, you know, with, with King Brown, it's, it's an excitement to, to get up on stage and, and um, take our practice lumps and, and, have cymbals crash on me unexpectedly or, you know, when I, Alex's pedals not work or whatnot, kind of just getting up there and, and being committed to something and, and striving to get better and, you know, sharing what we love to do with, with all of our friends and, and, you know, fans that come out to see us. And, uh, yeah. You bring up pedal boards cutting out and pedal mishaps or cymbals yeah. falling. Is yeah. there a, 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 what do you call it? A, a major blunder or a, a spinal tap moment that you that comes to mind from a show? No, I mean, we, no, not not so much. I mean, <laughs> I tend to put a lot of pressure on myself. You know, like if I if I chunk a fill or if I drop a stick, you know, in the back of my head, I'm kind of saying to myself, "Damn it!" You know, now I got to do something to make up for it, or at least pretend that that didn't happen. And you know, truth be told, I've I've seen plenty of live shows, and it happens to other drummers, and you notice it for maybe a split second, and then you forget about it, but for some reason, like I, I'm very, I'm very cognizant of, you know, what I'm trying to accomplish, which usually is not screwing the song up. Um, (laughs) I mean, rather other than, you know, the occasional hitting the bass drum too hard and it's moving all over the place on me, or, you know, I break a stick mid song. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty minimal. I just tend to make a bigger deal out of it in my own head. 
Sure. Isn't that the truth though? I mean, when you're on stage and performing, you, you, like you said, you throw a fill or right. you drop a stick for a second, you miss one beat and it feels like the end of the world in that moment. Right. It's and like everybody's looking at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, the five drunk people that are in the front row are not going to remember a second of it a second after it happened. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just yeah, the overall sure. picture is so tight that who yeah. cares about the fill? Yeah. And I, I remember this probably goes back like, I don't know, four or five years ago, and I've never forgotten it. I won't mention his name, but we, a different band that I was playing in at the time, we had a show at the Hexagon, and there was a lot of people there, you know, a lot of friends, and the the bill itself got really good support, and, like, I dropped a drumstick in the middle of a song or something, and, you know, not a big deal. I, you know, just grabbed the, the one right next to me and kept playing or whatever, and we get done and I go outside and another, a, a buddy of mine, or I should say an acquaintance um, came up to me. and was like, Hey, great job. You know, you guys sounded tight. What da, da 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 And you know, the first thing that comes out of my mouth rather than, Oh, thank you. I appreciate it is, you know, yeah, it was okay. But I dropped that drumstick on this song or whatever. And he just said to me, that's rock and roll, dude. And <laughs> <laughs> I just, I've never forgotten that to this day. Cause every time, you know, in my head, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or I should have done this. You know, I tried and come back to his, uh, his, uh, great advice back then, which was again, you know, like, dude, that's just rock and roll. It happens, you know? And so I've, I've tried to not take it so personally. <laughs> that's really good advice. I think it takes, I'm speaking for myself here too. It, it takes a long time as a musician or I think a performer of any kind to internalize that idea where someone comes up to you and says, Hey, great set. Or I like the performance or that song. And the first thing that you say, like you brought up is, yeah, but I messed up on this or, ah, right. you know, the vocals were a little flat tonight and that kind of thing. First of all, no one really notices or cares generally. Right. And, and then getting that sort of uh, sense of appreciation uh, or humility, maybe as a performer, just to say, thank you. I appreciate right. that. Right. That's well, the that's the right response. That's always the right response when you get a compliment. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the funny thing is, you know, I mean, like obviously, you know, when when I'm writing or performing music, I I have it in mind that, you know, first and foremost, we want to be into our own music that we're performing and creating for people, but to have other people actually come up to you and, and compliment you on it, I think it's strange how, you know, in the back of your head, of course you want compliments on, on your hard work, but then when it actually happens, you know, you're not always prepared to take that compliment, mm -hmm. you know, just because, you know, again, like I put a lot of pressure on myself. And so it's, it's definitely a uh, learning in progress, you know, being able to, being able to say, Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Where does the King Brown sound come from? Cause I think it's easy to point your finger towards like a oh, white stripes or maybe even a Royal blood and that kind of standard two piece right, blues based yeah. thing. But I, it goes deeper than that. You guys have a little bit more uh, edge and a little more sort of grit and almost air. I know those are very generic open terms, but <laughs> there, what I'm saying is there's something very different about your sound that I can't just say, Oh, this is a white stripes copy. Like what influences do you pull to get the sound between you two? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I would say that, you know, if we go back to when I first heard Alex um, and, and the songs that he was writing, it sounded unique. It was something that I hadn't heard of. It was different than what, you know, the kind of music that I was, I was playing in my other band. And there was just something about it that when I heard it, I thought to myself, well, I could make that sound really cool, <laughs> you know, and, and it was different than anything I've really done before. I'm not used to, I mean, this is the first two piece band I've ever played in, uh, you know, with King Brown, I think it was really Alex writing the, the guitar riffs and, and the hooks and the bridges and all that stuff. And me just kind of coming in and putting in what, what I was hearing, you know? So a lot of it was playing off of one another. Um, he had, I'd say maybe like six or seven songs that he had written by himself. And he, you know, he plays drums in, in another band as well. So, I mean, he's more than, than capable behind, behind the drum set. And a lot of his songs had basic drum beats to them or, you know, general ideas. So I was just able to, to take those and, and listen to them and kind of tweak them and make them my own. Um, and then, you know, we would just sit and play off of one another and, and I, I can honestly say that, you know, there's, there's, of course, there's 
you know, maybe a pedal that he uses for certain songs or a couple uh, harmonies that he uses that's uh, similar to White Stripes or whatnot. And, but, you know, when we're playing, I don't even really think of it. I just think that, you know, I kind of got my own thing going on. He's got his own thing going on and they complement one another. I know that when, you know, we first got together, we were gigging within three months and, you know, our, our, the, the EP that you mentioned, the three song EP that we did, it was really just uh, kind of an effort to get something out there so we could, you know, book gigs with, with other bands and kind of get the word out that we were here. <laughs> and, um, you know, leading up to this uh, coronavirus stuff, um, you know, we were, we still are, but I mean, we were in the process of um, writing new material for a full length uh, CD that we were planning on putting out. Uh, this summer, we had a whole bunch of gigs lined up and, um, you know, things got kind of got put on hold for the time being, but, um, you know, we've got like 13 to 15 new songs and Damn. there's a lot of bangers in there. And, um, I think we have a better idea of the sound we're going for, you know, the so the kind of songs that feature different, different things that we, that we want to put emphasis on and kind of test ourselves and keep moving forward. So yeah, that's kind of the goal. So you've got tracks written for that, but you haven't started recording for the, the new full length. Right. We okay. have, like I said, we have like, I'd say maybe like 13, somewhere in 13 to 15 new songs that we've been playing for um, probably the last three months, three or four months. I mean, I think we've played maybe one or two of them live, just kind of throw them in there and see if we can pull it off. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got, just a whole duffel bag filled with new songs and it's kind of like you know with this this virus crap happening you know it, it feels like it's been christmas eve for three weeks oh my <laughs> god know, like, that's a good way to put it it know, does we want to we get out there and you know kind of hit the ground running with with uh you know new music and new gigs and and with a new energy and it you know this the whole situation kind of took the air out of that for the time being i mean we're still working on the side but the main goal is getting that new music recorded and kind of nailed down. What's your normal writing process like? Is it you two jamming or Alex kind of brings in a riff and you figure out a beat that serves it? Well, I think it, it, it really depends. I mean, I'd say, I'd say 65 to 70% of it is, you know, Alex coming to the table with, you know, a certain riff or a composition you know, like a two minute recording of, of some of the stuff that he worked on at home or whatnot. And then he'll, he'll bring it to practice and we'll just kind of go over it. I'd say that's probably like 70% of it. And then, you know, maybe 20% of it is us just dinking around in the practice space and coming up with something that, that slams and, and going with it. And, um, other times it's, you know, me having a beat stuck in my head for a couple weeks and just coming down, recording it on my phone, sending it to him. So, I mean, we try not to limit ourselves as to how we do it, um, but we also don't analyze it so much where it becomes work. <laughs> oh, God. You know, we, as soon as that happens, it, you're doomed. Yeah, yeah it, we kind of let it happen naturally. And trust me, I've, I've been in bands in the past where – you know, it's like a uh, it's like a toxic relationship. You want it to work so damn bad that you just squeeze all the life out of it. And the good thing is, is with Alex and I, we we haven't had any of that. Um, it's super easy to write with him. And I know when I'm at home doing my thing, I know he's on you know in, at his place doing the same. So that when we get together, we're bringing something to the table. We have a plan. We're always busy. Um, so that that's that always keeps things moving forward at least. Yeah, I talked last week with the guys of Exactly No, which is another two-piece for those that, yeah. that don't know. And that was one of the things that we talked about is just how convenient it is being in a small band. You know, I'm in a three-piece group. You, it's you and Alex and, and King Brown. And just how it's so much easier to uh, keep down the drama and to communicate clearly and to plan and to schedule practices and gigs. Right, right. So I, I definitely feel what you're saying. I want to talk about the, the visuals behind what's going on too i really love the banner that's up on your guys's facebook page the blue one and the yeah. e the eagle head ep cover so you design all that right yeah where, where does that where does that come from do you have a sort of a vision with the band like a certain style that you go for or is it just kind of top of your head no it's kind it's very random uh it's 
you know, I, I have a background in graphic design and, and art and I've always, I mean, in the bands that I've been in in the past, I've always just, you know, like to be creative with it and come up with, with cool looking stuff. And, um, you know, I, I guess given, given King Brown is one of those bands that is kind of bluesy, kind of alternative, kind of a few different things, you know, I, I try and keep it random. The, I, I know, uh, that, uh, Ross, your uh, your bass player there. I know he he he's very good with the visual arts and some of that. You know, mm-hmm. he and I click when it comes to art because, uh, you know, I know he's he's visually inspired and and I'm kind of the same way. You know, when I'm not putzing around the house or you know doing family stuff, um, I'm always doing something creative. Whether it's you know coming up with new uh, drum beats, drum fills, you know, song ideas. Um, I tend to stay away from lyrics, but, um, but yeah, like designs, uh, that come to the top of my head, I I might think of an idea and, um, you know, just kind of play with it. And sometimes it works out and it seems like it fits. And other times I put way too much effort into it and it looks like garbage. So we don't use it, but yeah, it, you know, a lot like, the songwriting process we just try and keep it fun and open and kind of take it day by day that's what i was going to say it's sort of like you mentioned earlier with the toxic relationship if you have to start overthinking your design or your song you should probably abandon it you know or, right. or come back later or just uh take the one little part that did work and run with that right for sure and and i think you know i think that's a you know that's kind of the curse of of the artist is you know we this is what we do. Um, we have to do it to be happy, but we're also very attached to it. And it's difficult to put that stamp of approval on our own stuff, whether it be music or, you know, a logo or, you know, a piece of art and say, yes, this is completed. This is the best I can do. You know, everybody look at it and listen to it. You know, here, here it is. I think that's, that, that's the challenging part, you know, when you're, when you're either a musician or an artist thinking about not over polishing things in the studio and letting some blemishes through that leads me into my first question of our lightning round oh boy so the first question of our lightning round these are just real quick simple answers would you rather have the studio record or the live album gotta go with studio photoshop or illustrator uh photoshop air drum or air guitar uh I'd have to go with air guitar because I've just I've had too much air drumming in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Change of pace. Yeah. Uh, have you ever driven a jet ski? No, I have not. Would you rather be summoned for jury duty or have to clean the bathrooms at Terminal Bar? Oh, brutal. Uh, <laughs> jury duty for sure. <laughs> okay, good good pick, dude. Uh, <laughs> David Lee Roth or Sammy Hagar? Oh, geez, David Lee Roth. Not there you go. Question. That's the right choice. I like me some Hagar, but that that's definitely the right answer. That's different Van Halen. <laughs> that's right. Cool. Well, let's let's uh, just kind of close things out with a song that you told me is one of your favorites to perform in King Brown. Let's talk about Black Mass. You want to give a little sort of background to the song and or why you like playing that one? Well, it's just it's just one of my favorites. I I think it has a has a really cool. Uh, melody to it um it's simple it has you know uh standard four count on the on the bass drum uh it's just simple i think the the chorus itself is is kind of catchy um and uh you know it has uh it it has its moments i would agree i really like the uh china symbol accents in this one and the little stops right before the i think right before it goes into the chorus there's a little da 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 Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah, that the first time I heard that song that stuck with me for like three days after I saw you guys, <laughs> seriously. So uh, for those that don't know, this is off the King Brown EP, the three track. You can find it on Bandcamp. Uh, go pick their stuff up. And if you're thinking, what the hell? It's only three tracks. It's quality over quantity. You don't have to sift through 12 filler ones to find the banger ones. It's right to the point. It's king-brown.bandcamp.com. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram at king underscore brown underscore band. Aaron, man, it's been good hanging. Thanks. Thanks for having me, bro. I appreciate it.